going to start now. This is our 154th Friday group meeting. The speaker is our beloved Dr. Karnika Seth. Earlier also she addressed our uh, Friday group. Uh, that is 51st Friday group meeting. The topic is cyber crimes and electronic evidence. That is on 28th April 2017. The second time that is on 14th Friday group meeting. The topic was changing laws of data protection and privacy in India. That is on 13th May 2019. Today's topic is new intermediaries, guidelines 2021 and intermediary liability in cyber space. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Karnika ji. I request Rahul will give you a small CV of you just for after this thing. Dr. Karnika Seth is an internationally renowned cyber lawyer, an aggregated international arbitrator, accomplished author, policy maker and a highly inspiring speaker in tech think tanks, conferences, media and television. An eminent cyber lawyer and advocate in practice for over two decades, she actively handles cyber crime matters and cyber law related litigation. She is the founder of Seth Associates, an established law firm in India that advises global companies on information technology and media laws, IPR besides other areas. She has been appointed as a legal advisor to the Ministry of Information Technology, Government of India, and advises the government on various international and national initiatives to strengthen India's cyber law regime. She has actively contributed to the work of the E-Committee of the Supreme Court of India on making our e-filing process in courts across India robust and efficient. On the UN International Women's Day, she received the Great Indian Woman Award in 2021 and the India Beyond 75 Platinum Excellent Amrit Award 2022 for excellence in the new and future tech laws. She graduated in law from Delhi University and attained Master's in Law from King's College, University of London, Doctorate degree in Cyber Law, PhD from NIU. He specialized in com uh, computer security from Harvard University and is the member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in London. She is also an impellent arbitrator with World Intellectual Property Organization, Geneva, and the National Internet Exchange of India. Mm -hmm. This uh, published, uh, this book was published oh. by Karnika Se recently 2022 excellent book uh, commuters internet and new technologies technology laws thank you just thank you so much thank you, it's okay am i audible yeah it's indeed a matter of great uh, pleasure for me to be here again with the Friday group and uh, today we are going to be talking about intermediary liability. Intermediary liability is a very important uh, area of cyberspace and as we all understand uh, the implications are far too many and that is the relevance and importance of today's uh, talk on intermediary liability. We will be covering uh, various aspects throughout this talk who, uh, who is an intermediary as per the law. Uh, we'll also be looking at the various kinds of uh, you know, provisions which are there relevant to this topic uh, in the IT Act. And uh, we look at various dimensions of this liability regime, uh, particularly when we talk about direct liability, uh, the contributory liability and the vicarious liability aspect. So uh, we will start by uh, you know, a couple of these provisions and then we'll obviously be talking about the uh, case laws connected with the same. Initially, I just want to start with, you know, Section 21W of our IT Act. As we all understand, IT Act is a special law in the country which governs the internet and cyberspace and all electronic transactions there. The Section 21W in particular talks about or rather provides uh, you know, the definition of who is an intermediary. Now as per the act, intermediary is defined as any particular, you know, any particular uh, with regard to electronic records uh, means any person who on behalf of another person receives, stores or transmits the record or provides any service which with respect to that record and includes any telecom service provider. For example, you have an email service provider, or you these days we have online shopping malls. We also have uh, various uh, service providers like internet auction sites, online auction sites. 
and cyber cafes and uh, you will see online payment sites which facilitate payment transactions for various uh, you know i would say e-commerce which is happening online so all all these are basically an intermediary as per the definition of the intermediary uh, you know in the it act now coming to the other provision uh, which is very important for our discussion is 79 of the it act now section 79 if we see that section in particular it is basically giving exclusions or exemptions from liability now coming to section 79 when is an intermediary not liable it is actually of the nature where it can take as a defense so uh, in a case where the accusation or the uh, government or allegation of a party for example a plaintiff is that the platform for example if it's a social media platform or if it's an e-commerce or a shopping mall there is a liability plaintiff alleges there is a liability on their part which is contributory or direct for instance copyright infringement or trademark infringement or it could be any other uh, you know fact scenario there the defense can be taken by an intermediary that if it's for example an online shopping space it is not some the seller he is not the seller or the platform is not the seller but is only providing a you know a means a, a, a a space where the buyer and seller meet and exchange the information or goods in purchase of services takes place. Now, in such a scenario, there is a condition given under Section 79 that in such cases that, uh, you know, exemption is only available subject to, subject to the fact that this intermediary is neither initiating the trans transmission that is neither selecting who the buyer or seller will be, what is the content which is exchanged between the two, that is not determined, plus it's not modifying the content either. So neither deciding the receiver of the transmission. So that is a key uh, feature that one has to satisfy. Apart from that, there is also, uh, you know, an intermediary is not liable for any third party data. Third party meaning, for example, on a social media site, somebody is posting as a user. So that is third party content. They are also not liable for that content which is being put up, even if it's infringing, because such a platform like maybe, you know, if you look at uh, social media platforms today, big giants, Facebook or other, uh, you know, platforms, they cannot monitor every day basis the millions of pages and posts being put. So from that perspective, this was so that there is no chilling effect on the freedom of speech and uh, internet is not freedom is not curtailed that this provision helps to that uh, in that extent that such platforms can easily and freely transact business however they will be subject to liability when they are conspiring or they are aware of the infringing actions and facilitating it that is where the contributory liability will come into play and also uh, they could be vicariously held liable where you know they have not taken due diligence measures that is another aspect to it that you may not have the knowledge actual knowledge but you have not you know basically looked at the due diligence aspect in that regard then if you have not you know uh, complied with the same then this exemption is not available so there are certain criteria laid down the intermediary uh, has to observe due diligence guidelines which are given by the government and we are talking going to talk about the new and the old guidelines of 2021 and 2011. 2011 guidelines of due diligence of intermediaries have been superseded by the new uh, rules which are of 2021. Now um, as I said if there is a conspiracy of the platform with the seller for example it knows that there is a uh, there are fake goods being sold on that platform. Certainly that platform will be liable if there are facts and evidence can be led to prove that there was a contributory uh, factor or there was a conspiracy happening in those scenarios. And uh, upon actual knowledge, supposingly, <coughs> there is a particular uh, ob obscene content, for example, on a particular uh, platform that has to be removed. So the notice has to be sent and the police, for example, you know, conducts investigation and says that you need to take this down. 
so that taking down has to happen within 36 hours. In case of sexually explicit content, the new guidelines say that you have to do it in 24 hours. So that is the stringent uh, law which we have in the country today. And if they fail to remove this content or take it down, then there are definitely repercussions. The legal remedies come into play and uh, the liability can you know, be invoked under uh, any law which is applicable, even IPC and IT Act. So that is uh, the current uh, position of Section 79. I'll come to the intricacies of the same. Uh, with citing some, some examples of what we have seen in terms of case law in the country. And uh, before I go to that, there is another material section which I want to point out which is 85, which is for deemed liability of directors. Now in such a uh, case, in deemed liability, every officer who was in charge of effective uh, monitoring of the organization and responsible for the computer, computer system or resource, if is being negligent or has the knowledge and yet he has uh, not taken due measures to uh, correct that, you know, uh, take down uh, that particular infringing material on actual notice or otherwise can be held liable because that is a provision of deemed liability. That is, uh, they have to prove that they conducted their business with due diligence and uh, there was effective monitoring happening and they had no knowledge of such illegal activity happening within their organization or through the use of those network and resources there. So that is section 85. How different is it from the earlier section? You know, this was um, the 2011, you know, there were the earlier rules and even section 79 prior to 2009, that is 27th of October 2009 was a different section altogether. Now, in that particular uh, section, the provision said that network service providers will have to prove, you know, in order to uh, escape liability, that they had neither, uh, you know, uh, they had exercised due diligence and they had no knowledge of this offence being committed in their company. They had to prove it. Now, the uh, in that particular section 79, it was only pertaining to the purview within the IT Act. Now there is a non-obstantive clause which has been added in the section 79 which, which means that even if um, you know an intermediary uh, you know he can claim uh, exemption even if he other laws actually if you invoke the other laws he could be held liable under those laws but if he has <coughs> able to satisfy the due diligence and other parameters of section 79 he can actually claim the exemption from a liability not only with, within the confines of the IT Act but for any other law because this is a special law. So that is uh, you know the power of this section 79 now and uh, it's it's uh, been expanded in terms of scope even with regards to the kind of intermediaries which can be clubbed under this particular provision. Okay, so coming to uh, the aspect of new rules. Now, under our old rules of 2011, there was this uh, condition that you have to, you know, satisfy. Uh, there has to be a privacy policy, a terms of use by every website owner. Now, these conditions and then they have to apprise the user that they cannot upload such content which is, uh, you know, unlawful which is uh, defamatory or which is uh, something which is objectionable like you know, obscene or otherwise. Uh, there are also, you know, certain, uh, there were also other provisions like having a grievance redressal officer in their organization which redresses the complaints. Now similar to that is now the current law but the 2000, you know, uh, the current 2021 rules have made the pro problems in these uh, considering the kind of implementation uh, you know problems which are occurring the speed of implementation is slow so in order to enforce the laws better they have made the provisions more stringent having said that things like spoofing you know hiding one's identity using vpns or otherwise you know sending messages even fake news they all can be covered under the new rules so they are asked not to send such a, certain messages like these or impersonation 
you know, uh, messages which uh, threaten the sovereignty or integrity of India. And there is a power to block with the website. The website can actually block and terminate such accounts which are, you know, using phishing or other kind of techniques to, uh, you know, commit crimes. So that is there. And we see that all the time. There is a lot of uh, positive uh, implementation of the same because uh, like in the payment app scenario, the banking ombudsman uh, in the banking system, they are effectively resolving complaints. Similarly, grievance redressal officers, they are supposed to be now resident in India. That's a very good measure because earlier there was a, just an automatic message being sent which was not leading anywhere. But now they are supposed to within a timeline of 24 hours in obscene cases and obscene material cases and otherwise within 36 hours they have to get uh, this you know problems resolved and uh, within 15 days is a timeline given for uh, complete resolution of the complaint and 72 hours to you know get back and you know even cooperate with the law enforcement agencies so that is uh, a quick uh, remedy which has been given and uh, solves many cases initially then coming to uh, the point that whatever data they collect, they are supposed to collect it for 180 days, they have to keep that data. If there is a complaint case, the logs have to be maintained, IP address has to be maintained. Now social media giants say we have encryption, we don't monitor content, but they are supposed to identify the originator, who is the first originator. And because these videos, these messages, fake news goes viral, so how do you curb that? That is why the government has introduced these new rules that at least you let us know who is the originator. So the IP can be tracked and the cases can be you know, resolved based on that. So that's another good measure and uh, they have to obviously maintain privacy and other uh, practices as per the IT Act. They are supposed to do that. Now reporting of cybercrime incidents is on the cybercrime.gov.in portal and thousands and I think uh, recently there was a meeting at the MHA also we were discussing the same and there are I mean thousands of cases which have been reported in a year more than 25,000 so you can imagine uh, the pace at which cyber crime is increasing every second there's a crime and these rules are becoming uh, more and more relevant and more and more important uh, from that point of view to curb cyber crime and to get a legal redress of the same so um, now Another important aspect of these new rules is that they have identified these big giants, social media giants as a significant social intermediary. Now as per that, if they have a user base of 5 million or more, then they, are, they actually have more due diligence norms to be followed. So they have to have a chief compliance officer, they have to have a nodal contact, then a grievance officer. And the data security measures are also higher. You know, they are supposed to comply uh, with various uh, reports and uh, tech tools to identify uh, what uh, you know information is being put on their platforms. Uh, they can have, like in Facebook and otherwise, you can have a tick sign, you know, verified account. They can voluntarily ap apply for a verif verification of their account. And uh, you know, the softwares which they are developing should be not you know, uh, I would say violating data ethics, you know, data science. We have AI, we have metaverse, we have, you know, we're talking about crypto today. Whatever softwares you're making should not be, they should be free of bias and discrimination. So that kind of ethics has also been, uh, you know, reflected in the new rules. So the, the, the significant social media intermediaries, while they're devising these AI platforms, they will have to be mindful of these uh, data ethic norms as well. And then apart from that, uh, if you see, there is a acknowledgement that they have to give when they receive a complaint and act within the uh, timeline that is 36 hours. And I mean, they also cannot say that we don't have knowledge. You know, I'm coming to the main uh, issue of the kinds of involvement a platform can have in terms of engagement. It can be simply a conduit like a telephone company. Uh, or an email provider, it can have more involvement like an online shopping mall. When we buy goods from a particular shopping mall, sometimes the bill is raised in their name, uh, warranties are given, they <coughs> guarantee that the, you know, the, the particular uh, goods are going to be genuine. 
and they also have delivery boys <clears throat> they have delivery logistic support so can we say they are just an intermediary these are questions of evidence you know they will involve evidence they are questions of fact and in a lot of cases you would have seen the amazon case also the judgment where <clears throat> very uh, elaborately this has been explained that who is an intermediary and these questions require a proper trial so you cannot immediately on a prima facie basis in an interim model say this is an intermediary or not an intermediary so that's the interesting part of uh, you know this these kind of cases and uh, when it comes to you know uh, the liability aspect of such intermediaries there have been many cases you know there are plethora of cases by now but i'll take you through the journey i wanted to discuss the provisions and some basics of uh, you know the aspects involved while while we're discussing these uh, you know scenarios and what are the key legal concepts but now uh, talking about cases the earliest uh, i can recall is bazi.com case the first uh, you know case where we actually extensively dealt with this and there it was a if you recall the dps mms clip involved and that was uploaded by somebody on an auction site the ceo of that auction site uh, you know in bazi.com avnish bajaj was arrested and uh, there was a prosecution which followed 292 and section 67 of the it act publishing of transmission of uh, any kind of obscene uh, material right now if that is that were the provisions uh, in this case it was uh, finally observed in fact that despite actual notice the platform had failed to uh, remove this uh, obscene material obviously there was a liability attached to that and deemed liability of directors were the provision considered there section 85 and it was said that you know quashing can happen under you know uh, ipc or 67 67 it was said deemed liability provisions are there so it can but later on in anita hada case the same case was uh, looked into and then it was uh, held that where the company has not been arraigned as an accused the director cannot be made vicariously liable that was the final decision on that in the that factual scenario so the uh, obviously the fi got caught so uh, now coming to what happened later on i had the occasion to uh, you know argue one of the very interesting cases uh, nirmal chit singh nirula versus hub pages before delhi high court now there the question was defamatory material against the plaintiff and that defamatory material was not posted uh, you know in india but from abroad it was on hub pages platform which is a us based site and uh, they were hosting it also abroad now the question was does india have the jurisdiction you know the indian courts has the jurisdiction now defamation was taking place here party was affected here and if we see section 1 of our uh, it act read with uh, you know section 75 <coughs> we have a prescriptive jurisdiction we have uh, jurisdiction which is beyond indian borders if there, it affects any computer computer system or resource in india so the person was defamed here so we filed that action and the delhi courts said that they have the jurisdiction based on the banyan you know treaty case and uh, there has been you know interactive uh, i would say injury was there and the site was interactive it had user base in india as well so the registrar uh, of the website was asked to take down the material and uh, this was uh, the registrar cooperated and the party that is the main defendant the website itself actually uh, removed it voluntarily without submitting to jurisdiction of delhi courts so this was a case scenario very interesting one of the earliest cases of 2011 rules of uh, section 79 thereafter <clears throat> there have been many other decisions um, shreya singhal is one of the key decisions we all uh, know about shreya singhal case uh, a very important aspect of this uh, section 79 was clarified that uh, 66a was struck down because it was unconstitutional the words user of offensive material and they were very ambiguous what is harmful you know harmful or uh, objectionable is something that can be subjective so prone to misuse and that was the reason why it was struck down 
but one material aspect of that uh, Shreya Singhal case was that actual knowledge aspect was clarified. That if there has to be a blocking vis-a-vis -vis freedom of speech, 191A of the Constitution, Article 191A, if there has to be a, a blocking, it has to be only when there is a court order or order by an appropriate uh, government, agency of the government. That was clarified and that would be only in 69A, uh, Section 69A invoked cases where there is a threat to national sovereignty, integrity and uh, public order, decency, morality. Defamation would not come under that. Really. Right. So uh, that is what the import of that uh, you know, section uh, and that particular uh, judgment was and very relevant, very important judgment. Then we had uh, very interesting cases of copyright and trademark where, in, especially in the MySpace case, if you see MySpace uh, versus Super Cassette Industries. Uh, this case was a case where it was held that the scenario over there in Shreya Singhal was freedom of speech involved. We are talking about copyright in this case. And the court really held that there is a difference. There is a difference because we are not talking about freedom of speech, you are talking about freedom of trade. Copyright is something that one can, if a platform is informed that on your platform there is a copyright violation and given proof the same, they are supposed to remove that content within uh, 36 hours of actual knowledge of the notice. So in copyright and trademark cases, at least you know those, uh, this principle should be followed. Okay. Now, uh, there was also <coughs> another aspect that where there is a connivance, you know, in such cases, obviously if you are abetting a fraud, abetting an infringement, then you are a contributor. You can't say that I have exemption because I am excluded, I am an intermediary, <coughs> that plea doesn't work there. So we have to very carefully in every fact, you know, the case which comes to our, uh, for our uh, review, we have to look at the factual scenario, what is happening in that platform to analyze whether first one, you know, first point that this is an intermediary or not and if it is not an intermediary then it's a different question altogether but if it's an intermediary, can we claim this exclusion? Are we satisfying due diligence norms? Um, are we also, uh, can we say that we did not have knowledge which is not deemed or constructive, we're talking about actual knowledge and then we have also to look at uh, you know if you are, if you are following everything we we have conducted due diligence we had neither knowledge nor ability to control content did we give them a software which actually abetted the infringement those are the aspects very interesting aspects which these cases have really uh, brought up before us and so certain cases it was also examined where the platform itself you know showed uh, that there was a uh, uh, it, this was a shop clues case, if you recall that, uh, where there were fake products being sold. It was alleged that there were fake products being sold. And there was a website where it said replica window. So if, if a website is showing replica window, means they are uh, they're aware of the infringements which are happening. So that's what the court observed in such a scenario. They cannot say that, you know, they were not aware of infringement therefore they would be you know sometimes even a court could hold that there would be a direct infringement uh, by the party by, by the platform or they could hold in the circumstances that this is a contributory you know infringement now in super cassette industries uh, the the question was this if there were videos or clips or small uh, you know trailers which are loaded on uh, uploaded on say myspace platform and this myspace platform said that we were not aware of uh, any such infringements by people who have posted it but they were having the, uh, they had the ability to control content because they were actually editing and placing ads on the content they were able to modify the content also to that extent so if you have the ability the uh, you've reserved the right to monitor and you also, um, you know, abetting it in some way, giving your platform as place for profit. That could be at least a contributory liability, if not a direct liability. So those are very interesting questions which are being examined in these kind of cases. And um, interestingly, uh, in, in, you know, cases abroad, if you see there have been Netcom case, the Napster case, 
and uh, Grokster where P2P file sharing uh, you know uh, portals were into picture and then the, again the same uh, principles were examined whether the platform was abetting the infringement or not whether it was uh, directly um, involved or was it only facilitator or abetment but in our uh, section 79 it says very clearly even if it's an abetment it doesn't give you the right to claim exemption anymore <coughs> that's the principle which we all follow then there have been other cases uh, similar to netcom you have the sega ma mafia case you know and um, then there have been uh, lately x versus union of india you would have heard about this case as well i'm sure you'll be all using these precedents and you know interesting developments so if any obscene content is being floated um, you know on a particular platform and police informs that you have to remove this after a complaint is lodged. So on actual notice, if they don't remove it, then the platform is live. So they, in such a scenario, within 24 hours, they are supposed to take down the content. That is uh, when held. And there are global, you know, global blocking uh, possible, takedowns possible. Now, in, in such a ca case, uh, there have been decisions which say that it cannot be only limited to India, takedown only in India, they can be global takedowns. Those uh, cases are also interesting, I have seen that in the Swami Ramdev case, if you would have gone through it, versus Facebook, Swami Ramdev versus Facebook, the defamatory content was there, it was um, directed to be taken down because there was defamation happening and it was held in that case that this cannot only be uh, limited to geo blocking like within india takedowns but it has to be global because if a platform has the ability to take down content on voluntary basis then why not obey the court order which makes sense logical sense they have the technical capability then they should be able to do it in such a scenario if they are doing business here they are supposed to obey the orders of the court otherwise there will be contempt so that's what has been, uh, you know, uh, examined in those cases. Then um, I, I was also, go, you know, going through the Amazon case, which is very interesting. I've already discussed a bit of it, but the Amazon case uh, helps uh, clarify this area uh, to a great extent that this is more of not an affirmative enforcement provision, Section 79, where a plaintiff can say, I'm an intermediary. It is more of a defense. So that aspect has been very clearly brought out in that Amazon case. Then we had Google versus Vishakha. Again, an interesting uh, case in, uh, on point, but again, there was defamatory material put. And uh, it was held that there is no escape from criminal liability in such a case also. You know, if there's a defamation material, and this, now non obstante clause has been added, but before that, this case pertained to facts where there was an old, old provision where there was no exclusion from other laws, exemption from, uh, you know, operation for other laws. So under IPC, they said the IPC can still apply and uh, there would be no exemption from criminal liability on that account. So the section 79, the old section 79, it was clarified that vis-a-vis -vis 499 and 500 of IPC, that criminal liability can still be claimed, you know, that, that, that can be claimed. So, Likewise, there have been many other uh, important decisions, uh, but I want to just uh, throw light on this fact that when it comes to liability of intermediaries, the long and short of it will be that one examines what is the nature of activity and the rights and control and the policy of that particular platform. If the uh, rights uh, <coughs> reserve their ability to look at the content, and maybe even decide the receiver sender of a particular uh, you know service or content therein for example there are blogs today um, there are various other features like they are looking at the content and putting an ad on it or uh, they are providing other services so in the section 79 there is no difference in active passive websites or active passive intermediary that was also been discussed in all these cases. So, what is very clearly put out is the key criteria will be the due diligence aspect has been met with uh, by the platform or not, whether uh, there is a conspiracy or not, 
abatement or not I, are they gaining direct profits from that you know having that particular platform or is it uh, only a conduit uh, you know providing that space and not aware of the infringement in which is happening do they get an actual notice from the customer that this is happening and they remove this or not those are factors which we have to see and in specially copyright trademark cases they are supposed to take down if, if there is a violation in cases of obscene content they are supposed to take down if they can apparently see this is from fsi or obscene content within 24 hours take down but in cases where uh, you know e-commerce like i said online shopping malls it requires an extensive uh, trial actually to look into that fact and actually say whether this is an intermediary or not and therefore it is uh, important to see whether the platform was abetting or not or indirectly involved looking at all these facts mm -hmm. and then you know one has to decide whether there was an intermediary or not and if it was then can it satisfy all the conditions before it can claim exemption so if that is there then that argument will flow in that direction so having said that i think uh, we are still work in progress in terms of intermediary liability india if you look at india we have new technological developments happening every day how ai will play a role or how metaverse virtual reality or you know other kinds of violence happening on online space gaming uh, fake news all these are new things which we are still uh, making laws on and we are still uh, looking at various you know aspects of the these new emerging uh, future laws what will they be and from that point of view how if intermediaries are using these technologies will be impacted will there be a more stringent criteria for you know having uh, such uh, technical tools because we already see in the 2021 guidelines the use of data ethics and data science is reflecting similarly for the new maybe we'll have to pace fast and have a new set of laws which will you know deal with these issues and uh, very clearly examine them in light of whether still an intermediary can you know say that he has complied with all the due diligence norms of metaverse of ai or of you know uh, combating fake news have they deployed the technological tools required have they put the data safety and data protection mechanisms in place and can they say that we did not have knowledge of this infringement or we did not have actual knowledge so the concept of vicarious liability will have to be examined the concept of direct liability will have to be examined and then contributory liability will have to be examined but from the international scenario if we see the international scenario they say they mainly see in the netcom case also they saw whether there was an ability to block or ability to control content and reserved it reserved the powers to do that in the policies but in india we have an extra criteria of actual knowledge so we have actually added a a new pillar to it and we say that we have given them more immunity i would say more freedom to you know work as long as they are compliant with our due diligence norms as long as they are uh, not uh, deciding who the receiver will be or who is the initiator is what is the content and as long as they are not abetting or conspiring you know conspiring with the uh, you know, sellers uh, or otherwise you know the third party they can they can claim the exemption you know given under the section 79 of the it act now with this i just want to take up a few questions uh, from you all and uh, then we will we'll delve more into this while we are talking about it. would you like to have yeah i yeah. just want to know i'm the like the uh, india stopped uh, so many websites because from china yes and uh, yeah. is all the website has got a face or a corporate office like things where you are knowing that against whom you want to take action what is the mechanism that can we control the websites movement or the apps in india is it uh, there is a mechanism or the law knows it how to handle it yes an important uh, question we all uh, you know when when we deal with making laws or when we deal with law enforcement in these cases we normally see that um, there is an ip address linked to every system now 
I know the criminals are one step ahead. So they will use VPNs, they will use proxy servers, uh, various sites. You know, but now we have new set of laws. Every second day we have something new happening. So there has to be new laws for the same. So even the Ministry of IT has come up with incident response. So if a fraud happens, supposingly there's hacking. So within uh, six hours of that fraud, the new guidelines say that the company needs to report the same to the uh, computer emergency response team for immediate action. That compliance is there and they will have to cooperate with the uh, you know, law enforcement teams to find out from where this is happening. There is also log retention requirement. So they are supposed to keep logs, you know. And uh, this 180 days, again, they have to maintain the logs for, and they will have to give the logs for uh, investigation purposes. So all these payment sites, all the uh, e-wallet companies, even uh, non-financial you know, companies, e-commerce platforms or otherwise, they are supposed to keep these logs and cooperate with the law enforcement. Yes, uh, there are criminals who are using Tor, who are using anonymous proxy servers and other you know, servers. Therefore, for such cases, there is a cooperation needed. You know, and for financial data, there's a strict uh, now guideline that they have to st save that uh, mirror image copy of that in India. The, you know, the, the data has to be in India. In fact, the RBI is keen to have the data uh, entirely saved in India, which pertains to financial uh, transactions of Indian users. So, the other data can be non-sensitive data, which is not payment related, can be in a server abroad, but available for investigation reasons or you know identification reasons uh, on a incident response as a part of the incident response when it is reported. So. There are new set of laws we have to come up with and there are still some grey areas which we are trying to you know, curtail. But to whatever extent possible, uh, the tracking is happening and cooperation is being sought. The only area which, we, uh, which I immediately recall is this, uh, the convention on cybercrime. We have not yet signed a convention. India has still not signed. So for cross-border crime, Interpol is there, we have MLAT system, letter regulatory system, which is very smooth. So that is an area which one really needs to work on as well. Rahul, you want? Uh, question I just want to ask, we are talking about the intermediary liabilities. Supposing there is a website in which some obscene cons uh, concern has been told by anyone. So they are taking the defense that we are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. So would not the government should it mandatory that while building the website, they should with the help of the AI, they should look, keep it like that, like they have, what every video has been uploaded, it should be go through the AI. Hmm. If the AI found out that there is some obscene content, they should not upload it. Yes, so I agree. That to, to that extent, <coughs> you know, these norms are being very strictly followed in child pornography cases. Yeah, absolutely. We are, you know, we see platforms use DNA photo hash mechanism and there are various other means by which keyword filtering is happening absolutely. and they are removing this content. Likewise, duplication of such content, especially if it is the same content being made viral. We've had the concept of dynamic injunctions of late. You, we will all be aware of uh, those Ash Ashok Kumar orders or the John Doe orders, we call them. So, in those cases and even in, uh, you know, uh, most of these decisions, uh, whether it comes to dynamic injunctions, they give a ban on duplication of this content so that it can be immediately blocked. Time and again, the litigant doesn't have to come and approach the court every time there's a new link which is circulated. So that is the, the uh, I would say, advantage, uh, extreme advantage, I would say, great advantage of having these dynamic injunction orders. And uh, that is serving <coughs> the justice, you know, ends of justice in this case. No, what I mean to say, the website is in our control. Because India, I built a website. Yeah. <coughs> that is in my control completely. Yeah. I'm giving some privilege to someone to upload some data over it. Yes. That's a different thing. But that should, should, that should be in my perusal. Absolutely. I should be saying if it is okay, then it should be on the website, otherwise I'll... So you are talking about pre-censoring. Pre-censoring. Pre-censoring, in, uh, especially in those cases where it is your own website. You can choose to do that out of uh, due diligence measures. But in cases of, as an intermediary if you are talking, then for social media you know, related or other intermediary cases, that pre-filtering or pre-censorship is only uh, 
right now and possible in that extent of child pornography or other cases you know uh, it is not something it's more out of self regulation than a government uh, requirement yeah, yeah but that self regulation has uh, now merged with uh, certain industry norms now because uh, i would say it is expected now it's part of the guidelines also the new rules of 2021 for instance have a stricter guideline to remove uh, obscene content out earlier this was not there 36 hours was 36 hours now why we have 24 hours for this kind of content because we are trying to uh, enforce our laws better we are trying to make a small stringent law to that effect maybe it is 24 hours will further reduce to 6 hours so, like we have in cyber uh, incident response yes. cases so likewise we are we are seeing a growth in terms of evolution of law and depending on the demands of the situation so maybe the next step will be pre filtering as a mandatory requirement okay. but the social media platforms are not uh, you know they say this is not technically feasible because it will stifle the uh, freedom of trade and freedom of speech because we can't possibly monitor so many millions of pages every day that's the usual uh, stand that they have actually taken in such scenario and keeping that uh, difficulty in mind these provisions have been section 79 has been enacted you know so for 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 it to change we will have to change uh, the section 79 also to that to that you want to ask any question madam please send uh, yeah yeah please this back i joined sir yeah it's all right. you want to ask some law just you also join rahul you want to? yeah please that in yeah please please, uh. please. Uh, one example like that it's uh, banks and some that uh, uh, you don't uh, click it in is there any mechanism to stop that and uh, uh, the agencies giving an ad if they spend on the investigation to stop that frauds and uh, people book in the uh, uh, behind the bars are the correct legal ad. so it it can be act as a threat uh, your view about it <laughs> because uh, sometimes they uh, we alert that sms in uh, yes. even recently sbi act and in, in, in full fledged ads are coming in but uh, there is no kind of an uh, information that uh, banks or the government agencies have taken steps to the fraudulent uh, okay. and uh, brought to the books of the yeah. justice so, uh, Uh, the Reserve Bank of India has passed various guidelines on that effect, and uh, there are also, you know, uh, Ministry of uh, Home Affairs also has uh, this uh, helpline is there one nine three zero, and uh, cyber frauds are being reported on national, uh, you know, cyber crime dot gov dot in portal, and as per the, uh, you know, uh, the statistics of NCRB also, it has uh, the cyber crime incidents have risen uh, to a great extent uh, in, in India. and particularly crimes against uh, you know uh, for the motive of financial fraud specifically data related frauds or other financial frauds have risen uh, to a great extent and uh, recently i, I was just uh, you know every second day there are lots of queries coming on financial frauds itself uh, that we handle and lot of times there are the lottery scams some are the job scams and uh, some are even uh, the you know uh, like i would say purchase of uh, these uh, gadgets so there will be a fake site where there's a promotional uh, you know discounted rate and they will all be fake so if you recall uh, in relating to intermediary liability only uh, there was this uh, case against go daddy recently if you recall i think snap deal versus go daddy so here also uh, they were you know examining whether the uh, inter whether the registrars of these websites are uh, you know liable or not and whether they are intermediary or not so that aspect was examined and when you register a particular domain it is the user the subscribers uh, you know uh, due diligence that he needs to see if he is infringing anybody's website because otherwise uh, the platform cannot be made liable for this that is what was held in this case in terms of intermediary liability and uh, interestingly uh, you know these uh, cases are coming and the banks as i said banking ombudsman scheme is in order and their awareness campaigns being launched by uh, the banks also they are tightening up the data uh, you know investigations uh, relating to data especially financial data and the awareness is obviously there the need for training that goes across all stakeholders 
but rbi as such is doing a lot there are recently they passed uh, guidelines even uh, you know for platforms which are selling uh, you know uh, i would say advertising loan disbursements so um, there were so many suicides in the country being reported in the press and <coughs> india that people are you know uh, becoming harassed for no reason by these uh, fictitious uh, scam apps and uh, you know there is no due diligence which is being done so there has to be a strict kyc norm and that is what has recently been passed by the rbi so as and when these new issues come we grapple with these issues make new laws and new rules come into play so kycs have to be made stronger definitely i agree on that you want to please no <coughs> yeah yes thank you very much kanika so nice of you thank you intermediary is uh, very nicely explained initially even myself mm -hmm. was what exactly the 2022 rules uh, and the 21 wrt act and 79 it act nicely explained thank you very much and one more thing of the beauty of the karna karnika is she is always in 11th hour rescue of our friday group and myself <laughs> <laughs> suddenly i jumped and she rescued and she joined as a other speaker some trouble and other thing when the long back it was arranged he said then i requested her when earlier times also even midnight also sometime without any this thing i just simply give me 15 20 minutes thank you very much my pleasure sir it's always a pleasure to be here and uh, it's a privilege to be part of our friday group fraternity and uh, i heartily support uh, this initiative because uh, it gives us a platform to understand and learn from each other and uh, it's again uh, i would say i'm i'm grateful for this uh, interaction and i hope you uh, enjoyed uh, learning and sharing this knowledge with me yeah, thank we'll you take your autograph and then uh, your message also karnika autograph next page